All right, well, welcome. So this is uh, the seminar on residential real estate for the Royal and Mary Mount Accredit uh, Real Estate Accreditation Program. Glad you guys are here. Uh, you get a lot of attention from me. So no talking in class. Sure. So uh, anyway, welcome, welcome. So we're today we're going to talk about so the, the world of residential real estate careers and and so on. So. Uh, here's the overview. So we're going to do a detailed discussion exploring the career path and opportunities in residential real estate and discuss the process of entering the profession, starting and building a career, working with buyers, working with sellers, the escrow process, advertising and branding, the team concept, and building and maintaining a client base. Uh, we're going to talk about wealth creation through owning real estate. It's like we need a little space on the end, but that's okay. We'll focus on the Southern California real estate market, but the career and sales principles are universal to all states like Florida. A lot of these principles will apply. Where are you from? Southern California. What's, what city? Um, like near San Jose in Los Gatos. Got it. Yeah. yeah, certainly. Certainly heard of it. So, well, uh, when you get a residential real estate license in California, you can sell anywhere. In the state. So, anyway, but the principles, like I said, for the most part, Apply to all states, except uh, there are so each state has a little bit of different some different laws, and uh, for this part all these principles will absolutely apply. So we're going to do this in in three sections. Uh, first one is going to be real estate careers and opportunities. Uh, then number two, the life of a realtor. What's it like on a day to day basis? And then number three, we're going to kind of that we're going to we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about architecture and its influence on the Southern California lifestyle culture. And art, and we're going to focus on what we call mid-century modern, which is very big in Florida, uh, but uh, in Southern California is ground zero for the mid-century modern style, and it's just fun. It's a fun subject. There's a lot of history to it, so we'll get, we'll get to that. Probably going to go uh, since there's it's a small class present. Uh, you know, typically we go three hours on this, but we'll be sooner than that. We'll, we'll get out. And if you guys have questions, like as we go along, you just you ask me. Don't don't think. Don't wait for a natural stop or an end of a subject. You can just ask me anything. Okay, anytime. So that's couldn't tell. That's me. Uh, so I've been selling residential real estate for thirty years. My name is Gerard Bisignano, by the way. I've been selling residential real estate uh, for 30 years, actually, here in, 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 this, in this area, mostly in the South Bay. Hi, buddy. How are you? How are you doing? Good. Have a seat. What's your name? Jose. Jose. Gerard. Nice to meet you. Pleasure. We just started, so it's all okay, good, man. So, uh, like I said, in the business for uh, 30 years, uh, I'm a partner with a company. It's a Sotheby's franchise we're an international company but we it is a franchise so my partners and i own a territory which runs from long beach to venice right over here um i'd like to say venice italy but that's a big big territory so we've got nine offices 275 agents and we are because of our franchise we can actually put put offices in the territory long beach to venice but we can sell real estate anywhere uh so I've done over a billion dollars in sales. Uh, I have an undergraduate and a graduate degree from this great university. Uh, my main markets are Palos Verdes, Manhattan Beach, but I really sell everywhere. I, this, it says I've sold properties from San Diego to Santa Barbara, but actually even higher up than Santa Barbara. I kind of specialize in local and luxury coastal homes, but also homes of architecturally significant. So we'll get into that a little bit. And last year, uh, my team did, uh, we did 60 transactions, 100 million in sales volume. Uh, now, two members of my team may come here and uh, uh, I'll introduce you to them when they come in. Okay, so my team is made up of a full-time assistant with also, which she's also called the transaction coordinator. She kind of runs the paperwork because there's so much paperwork in residential real estate. In real estate, any sales apply to commercial real estate as well. I have a marketing person who does my ads and mailers to social media. She may show up here. Uh, her name is Ariel. And then I've got four sales associates. One may show up here. His name is Gianni. Uh, I was a, a co-host of the Six Part Radio a show uh, called Architectural Los Angeles. Uh, uh, 
several years back, we, we broadcast from some very architecturally significant locations. The Hollyhock House, which was a uh, which is here in Los Angeles, it's Frank Lloyd Wright's first uh, project in Los Angeles. How are you doing? Good to see you, Christian. Yes, sir. Good to see you. How are you doing, buddy? Doing excellent. Thank you. Good. So who? Uh, the, so a Hollyhock House was designed by an architect, the most famous American architect named Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, did, has anybody heard of Frank Lloyd Wright? Yeah. All right, we need a little bit of education on Frank Lloyd Wright. He 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 uh he died in in the in the sixties, but he is he is the most famous American architect. Anyway, so we broadcast from his first Los Angeles project called the Hollyhock House, uh, the home of Ray Cappy, who was the founder of an architecture school in Los Angeles here called SciArc, which stands for Southern California Institute of Architecture. He is a very famous home. He's passed away since. We broadcast from his home. We also broadcast from the campus at SciR in Los Angeles. And then we also on the show uh, interviewed uh, many influential people in the architectural world. I have uh, participated in price records in the cities of Manhattan Beach, city of Rolling Hills, Belmont Heights, which is in Long Beach, and Palm Springs. So four of my sales have, have actually broken price records over the years. And my journey to this great university, I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's somewhat convoluted, but I'll give you kind of an overview. Uh, I was, uh, uh, after graduating from high school, uh, I went to junior college for a couple of years. I really didn't know what to do. Uh, I didn't know, you know, I was just kind of really, I uh, hadn't really planned out my future much. So I went to junior college, not that that means you go to junior college. And uh, after junior college, and then this is in the 70s. I decided, well, I'm going to go to UCLA. So I, I, I applied and was admitted to UCLA. And uh, so, you know, back then, I don't know when, when the spring, uh, when the fall semester starts here. Is it August or September? August. Okay. It was August then as well. So we're now June, just a few minutes before. I was talking with a buddy of mine from high school and who got admitted to UCLA. And he said, he said, well, what are you going to major in UCLA? And I said, I'm going, to major, <laughs> I'm going to major in business. He goes, dude, they don't have a business school at UCLA. You have to major in economics. That's what I'm majoring in. And I said, oh, and he's much smarter than me. And I thought, I don't want to major in economics. So I kind of quickly thought, well, well where can I go? I didn't want to go to USC. Uh, nothing wrong with USC because I have a son that just graduated from there. And then Johnny, who, who comes, who may show up, he went to SC as well. But I, I thought, gosh darn. So uh, I thought, well, Loyola, it's a great school. It's close by. And I'll apply to Loyola. And, uh, you know, I called them up. They sent me an application. I filled it out. I sent it in with my transcripts. Then I got admitted. I had never even been on the campus. That's the funny thing. So the first time I actually showed up at Loyola, which had just become Loyola Marymount, okay, it was a, it had just combined with Marymount. Um, First day I showed up for my class was the first day I'd ever been on campus. It was kind of funny, but it was the best thing I ever did. So I loved it here. I went here for two years and uh, just really excelled. I just loved this place. And it was a lot different back then, uh, as I had mentioned earlier. So did well. You know, what do you do? Uh, like, eh, got good grades. I'll go to law school, you know. So I got admitted to Southwestern, which is here in Los Angeles. And that was, it's a long story. I don't want to bore you too much with it. But I, after I was on a four-year program, after a year and a half, I thought, you know what? I, I'm not really keen on this. This isn't that great. And I, I, I had this girlfriend. She was a Swedish model in Tokyo. And so, I mean, you know, the story builds. And so and during the summer, between my first and second year, I'd gone and visited her there. And by happenstance, I mean, literally just I did some work with, with her and her, com her company. So I actually ended up modeling in Tokyo, came back, quit law school, and then she broke up with me, right? So I thought, so here I am out of law school and no girlfriend because I was planning on going back with her. So I thought, now what do I do? So I thought, uh, well, I, I modeled in Tokyo. Maybe I can do something with this for at least a little bit and for some time. It really was a time filler. And I got, I went to Europe and I was there for about six months and, and did, did the drill there. It was really fun. I had an unbelievable somebody at like 25 right now and in Europe and kind of doing this thing and it was fabulous. But I thought, I can, okay, this is kind of fun. I can't do this forever, right? 
I'm going to do even, even more. I mean, really? So when I came back uh, after six months there, had a great professor here at Loyola, Dr. Brown. He was kind of a mentor to me, and I checked in with him. And I said, I don't know what to do, man. I don't know what's next. I can't do this. I'm kind of doing this time filler. We just started an MBA program. He said, you should just, just apply. Uh, you know, you'll get in. I mean, it was a lot easier back then. It was go take the entrance exam. What is it? The GMAT for the entrance exam here? So I took, I, so I actually was had another traveling plan. And so I literally took the GMAT of all places, went to Tokyo. I took it there. It came back and I got into the MBA program. So, and, and that's how I, uh, it took me, uh, that was back then, it took, would only take about a year. I took another six months off and, and split back to Europe in between. So it took me a year and a half, I got my MBA from Loyola, and it was just fantastic. Fantastic program, fantastic school. And uh, I am very proud to be an alumni here. Uh, I, I kind of call Loyola Switzerland. It's got, you got SC, and then you got, you know, you got UCLA, and then, you know, Switzerland was sort of this neutral country back in World War II, so I call it Loyola kind of like Switzerland because you got these two other schools that kind of fight against each other, and everybody just sort of gets along with Loyola, you know. So, anyway, that's my journey. Hope I didn't bore you. All right. And that's part of my team, right? So, Gianni may come in. Uh, that's my sister, Tiana. That's of course, me, Mrs. Doreen, she's our training tag team. There's Gianni right there. Ta -da. Look, look. <laughs> there you are. And uh, he's a Trojan. So um, that's my team right there. It's part of my team. So I actually have a few more people you'll see in another photo. How you doing, buddy? Good. All good. You made it a picture. Okay. Good to be here. All right. This property is sold in Rolling Hills, which is in Palos Verdes. Those who don't know, I didn't take the photo, but the photo did win an award. And this was actually this house, which we won't really see any more photos of, but this house actually set a price for it in the city of Rolling Hills. Uh, 15 and a half million for sold. All right. Any questions? Yeah. Sir. I was just going to use So you think your undergraduate in business? Yes. Then, uh, yes, I really didn't tell you that. Yes, that's okay. correct. So do you later study architecture? No, good question. I actually I actually got that. I was uh, leading, I was uh, teaching at a group this morning from our office. That's the exact same question. How did I get into architecture? Because I am, I am known as an architectural expert. I don't know if I would call myself that, but people think I am. Am I? Yeah. Okay. You I don't know. Ask Kevin, yeah. but I, I'll get into that. It's okay. a good, it's a good question, but architecture is a sub is a sub market of mine. So I sell homes by the coast in Southern California, but homes of arch architectural significance uh, is part of my part of my market that I do. I'm going to talk about that. I sold these for you guys. You can come and get one. You know this home. Mm -hmm. This is the Coffin Desert Home in Palm Springs. It's one of the most famous homes in the country. Am I right? Yes, sir. You know, Gianni came with me many times when we showed this home. And I sold this home this past May, but I'll talk about that. Set a record for Palm Springs Park Park. Take one. Yes. All right. Thank you for asking. Any questions? You just, you know, send up a flare. I guess uh, what, what propelled you to get into architecture? Or you can't you ask have... questions. You know all the answers. No, I, mean, yes, <laughs> if you were... I will get it. I, it's a very good question, and I will, I'll get to it, though. I'll get to actually a, the client. I'll, I might as well mention it now. So the client that hired me to sell this home, the Kaufman Desert House, designed by Richard Neutra. Now, I had mentioned earlier Frank Lloyd Wright, the most famous archi American architect. Richard Neutra would be number two who has ever lived. Now, they're both, these, are, these guys are, have been gone for 50 years, but they are the most uh, influential and significant arch American architects. Uh, Rich, uh, Richard Neutra was actually Austrian, but he was an American. Um, and what happened is the owner of this home, uh, the Kaufman Desert House, now we have since sold it, so he's not the owner now. He was a client for, for many years of mine, and he and his wife had this enormous passion for architecture, and they would buy these architecturally significant homes, and they sort of they liked me as their agent for other homes, and they sort of 
they 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 really uh springboard they they my passion for architecture really springboard sported springboarded from their their influence on me and they would list homes with me that had architectural significance this one nothing surpasses this is architecturally significant in private hands there are some examples but they are not in private hands and in fact i'll show you a photo later of uh of one so uh these people sort of got me going and i caught it I caught fire with me architecture it's kind of like do you like cooking maybe you do maybe you don't right so what are you inclined what kind of passions are you inclined towards and ended up i had a, a passion i was inclined to have a passion for architecture i didn't know it until they sort of exposed me to it so that it sort of it sort of tumbled it, uh it took on a life of its own from there all right so i'm going to spring on to you we have any questions no so i'm going to throw at you what i call gerardisms right after 30 years in the business i come up with what you know little sort of truths what i call truth truthisms but i call them gerardisms so about residential real estate so not everybody in real estate is meant to be a superstar can't see that all but is meant to be a superstar uh, however everyone has the opportunity to be successful it's everything in life there's always those that are like just in the stratosphere uh, and everybody thinks that's who I want to be. And not everybody can be a superstar. However, you don't have to be a superstar to make an amazing, amazing living in residential real estate. Johnny will be a superstar. Right but so uh, I tell this, I, this is important for people that are in real estate that sort of struggling. This, gosh, I, why can't I be like this guy or this woman? Uh, in fact, the matter is everybody can be successful. Everybody has an opportunity to be successful in real estate, and you don't have to be one of these real estate reality show people, which we will talk about, by the way. Okay, so that's one truth. Though. Everybody has the opportunity to be successful in this business. There are people in this business that you really wouldn't know that are making amazing livings. You wouldn't know them as being, you know, oh yes, the realtor of the area. I know that person. I see their ads. A lot of people you never see that make amazing livings in this industry. All right, here's another one. What traits, what traits make a successful realtor? So anyone can put a house on the market. We put it on the, what we call the MLS. It's just the sort of like Zillow, if you've heard of Zillow, it's where houses go, where the public can see and other agents can see what's available to be purchased. So anyone can, you know, can get a listing contract, can put the home on the list, on the multiple listing, put a sign in your yard, right? Run an ad, receive offers for the home and sell it. I mean, anybody can do that. And this is true, especially in a strong market where homes just sort of sell on their own. Um, but top agents, right? The really great agents, the people that have great respect in our industry, uh, they earn his, their, their commissions really the moment somebody calls and says, I have a client who has very strong interest in the home. They've seen it. Uh, they're very interested in purchasing the home. That's what a great, a really good agent earns his, his or her commission because that's when an agent will support the home's value and the pricing, handle buyer and agent objections, follow with the buyer, follow up with the buyer and their agents, encourage an offer, screen the buyer and the agents to make sure that your your seller uh, is is dealing with somebody that can actually perform. Close that for on the deal. Negotiate strongly on behalf of their client to get the most money possible. When I say behalf of their client, I mean the seller. In our industry, you have an agent that represents the seller, the ones who put the sign in the yard. Uh, and then a lot of buyers have their own agent. Okay. So they, there's a, a buyer's agent and a seller's agent. And they will split the commission, the contractual commission. In California, the seller pays the commission for both buyer and seller's agents. And uh, so, uh, but they'll negotiate on behalf of their client, strongly on behalf of their client, the seller in this case, open escrow, which is the process of, of, of transferring title and getting the money to pay off the loan and give the proceeds to the seller and so on. Handhold the transaction through the escrow process and get the deal over the goal line. That's when a really good agent earns their key. And you close escrow, ka-ching, right? 
Everybody understand those concepts? See, some of this, for me, this is second, this is such second nature. I want to make sure if there's, a, like, if you don't, what is escrow? Ask me, okay? If you don't know, what is what is the MLS? I told you that's multiple distinct. It's like Zillow. Everybody heard of Zillow? I don't imagine so. So Zillow is for the public, but MLS is for professional agents. You learning something? <laughs> yeah, you know everything. Okay, here's another Girardism. The definition of a realtor, pure and simple, just a very objective definition would be someone who accommodates the transfer of property title, one party to another through the real estate sales process, right? So I own a home, the realtor take, is my listing, buyer comes through, we accommodate the transfer of title, I am no longer the owner, the buyer is now the owner. So in a pure and objective sense, that's what we do. However, in our business, we really are legal counselors, marriage counselors, this just comes with the process, grief counselors, accountants, paper pushers, event coordinators, Uber drivers, secretaries, personal assistants, salespeople, escrow officers, architects, space planners, arbitrators, crisis managers, and bartenders. Ta -da. Because real estate, residential real estate is a, is a relationship business. You'll take seminars with a lot of commercial brokers for, for Loyola. And uh, the commercial real estate is very business like. Do the numbers work for the buyer, right? Because typically they're going to buy a commercial real estate property to lease it out, maybe put their company there, uh, to, to, to maybe they buy an apartment building. Do the numbers work? Do the rents, the money they're putting down, does it cover their mortgage and then some income? Uh, return, but residential real estate is emotion. It's someone is buying a house to almost typically because people might buy a second residence as an investment, but they're buying it for themselves, for their family. They're going to raise their kids there or they have raised their kids there. Now they have to sell. It's very emotional. So we have, we have a lot of, we, we fulfill a lot of roles in residential real estate and I like it. I'm very inclined to it. I'm a people person and my son who does commercial real estate, he says, <laughs> Yeah, I gotta be honest with you. I, I don't want all this relationship stuff, right? So, but I'm a relationship person. All right. Section one. Any questions? Okay. You have any? Hey, you. You have anything you want to add? Uh, yeah. Not yet. Okay. I'll I wanted to bring Johnny, and maybe Ariel will come too, because I wanted to show you that it's not just old guys that are in, re in real estate, right? So Johnny graduated from SC, what, six years ago? Yeah, yeah. Six or seven. Yeah. So, so and Johnny's been with me a couple of years. Yeah. Something. Yeah. So, all right. Get into careers and opportunities. By the way, maybe there's an exception or two, but all the homes that you'll see in these photos, I sold. Um, okay. Why residential or real estate is a career? Uh, strong earning potential. Uh, flexible schedule, uh, independence. It's a relationship industry, as I explained. It's ageless. Look at me. I have another 10 years, and I'm an old guy. You know, you can, I, I know people that, I'm not that old, but the people are much older than me, they're in business and they're doing well. Right. So you can really kind of it's it's not a young person's industry. It used to be exclusively an old person's industry, but not not anymore. Uh, as a California real estate licensee, I can sell anywhere in the state. Uh, you can get you can get a multiple state license. Right. Let's say you go. Let's say you go back and forth between Florida and here. You can license in both states and so, you know, and and, and residential real estate is kind of sexy. you right. So you go into a Starbucks and you are talking to somebody. And, uh, you know, hey, what do you do? I'm in residential real estate. Really? What everybody asks, what's the market? Like? What's going on? Right? I mean, you know, I hear that the rates are going up. And so what's happening? What's the, so everybody wants to know. Johnny, is this true? Absolutely. Yeah. I would say, uh, you know, it's just an industry that people want to know. People are drawn uh, to it. Yeah. They're drawn they're excited to, about it. They're excited about it. People want to know what's happening. What's happening in real estate sales? So, uh, I have a question. So, yeah. the whole thing, state license, 
so in this case, if I get my license, I'll for it. I want in the future one to start selling in New York. I would have to do also the exam. Yes, in New York. Yes, you would. Yeah. And so, but but the but the fact of the matter is, you can be bi coastal. Yeah. You would have to get a license, but you could do it. So, like, I have a friend of mine that's kind of he's got a daughter that lives in uh, in uh, Alabama. Uh, she went to Auburn. It's in Alabama, right? <laughs> yeah. So and so he's kind of uh, he's just getting his license in Alabama because he wants to spend time with her there, and he's just a, he's just a, somebody with a great deal of drive, and he can't stand still, and he's he's getting his license in Alabama. So when he spends many months there a year, he can actually start a business there as well. Then come back. He's going to go back and forth. So you have that opportunity, and a lot of people do that. By the way, I was going to ask because I, I follow some guys that sell property in New York. It's already a big company. So how does it work when you already have like a big company established and you want to open another city? Like those the in this case the owner or father because these guys sell in New York and they're going to start selling in California. It's a great question. Uh, do they have to do the license? process or yes or in this case like the people they're gonna hire or uh, yeah you you have to get a license here to sell here in any state now there are some states that have what they call reciprocity uh i don't know i can't really tell you which ones but for instance one state you let's say you get a license in nevada sometimes other states that connect to it will recognize that license and so you can sell if you get a lot and, and don't quote me on this but you know if you let's say you get a license in nevada you could also sell in colorado some states have that reciprocity california does not uh so however the trend for very big agents on um, mostly on the east coast mostly reality tv show people they they think they've got this name then they come and they do the same thing here in California. So now they've got brokerages on both coasts. It's happening much more than ever before. How do you keep your real estate team motivated year round, especially when the market is in poor conditions? It's <laughs> a good question. Uh, well, so uh, we have been in a very strong market for up until six months ago. The market has been COVID. Who knew that COVID would do what it did? It, it, it just propelled the market. And my team, we've done some really great business in the last couple of years. And I kept telling them, what did I tell you? Well, the real estate? Or yeah, well, well, that's <laughs> one, that's one of my, yeah, that's one of my, I said, this is great. It's not always uh, like this, right? Be prepared. It's not always like this. Uh, so we've entered into a recession. We'll see how long it lasts. We don't know. This will be my fourth recession in the course of my career. So, um, you know, it's, it's, you, 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 how, what keeps us motivated? I stay in touch with, with it. I don't have a big, big team, uh, but I call uh, the, the other people on the team. I talk with Johnny really almost every day, yeah. even though he doesn't come in the office every day. I talk with him almost every day. And it's like, look, you know, it's pep talk, market slow. I'm sure you're talking to other realtors. I'm sure you hear the same thing. You know, look, everybody, luckily, everybody on my team is uh, not, counting on the next paycheck to live uh, which would put more stress on me personally but that doesn't mean they don't want to earn and they do and we all do so we're you know we're, we're doing some new things and i'm keeping the team motivated by telling what we're doing. we just hired ariel that may show up here she's a full-time marketing person so she will gianni wants to do a mailer we'll talk about mailers and farms he, Ariel can coordinate that for him so that he can try and reach out and try and get business because I'm actually kind of busy. You know, I can't, I can't coordinate, hey, you know, let's pick a farm. Of course, I advise. But uh, so we're just, you know, even at the time when, when income uh, is really down, I'm actually spending more money. So with this marketing person. Um, so good question. Thank you. Good, very good question. Very relevant to these times. Sophie, any questions? Okay. All right. So that was why really. Now, what are the challenges? Well, economy fluctuation. We we're just talking about that. Income can be absolutely inconsistent. It's very competitive. Uh, but what who what industry is it, right? Uh, it's challenging to start a career. Johnny's in his second, he's just in his second year in real estate. That's 
kind of a baby, really. So, you, you know, you, you have to sort of map out, you know, how am I going to get things going? And I tell people when I teach uh, all the time, uh, hardest part about real estate, Billy, is starting. You know, don't let that stop you. But it is the hardest part because you're, you're jumping into a career where people, a lot of people have a reputation already. They have built-in clientele that you may know so many other people that are, but these people know the other person for many years as a realtor, but we'll talk about it. But the, all these challenges are inherent in nearly in many industries. A couple of homes I sold, both on the bluster, or actually down the street from each other, uh, in Palos Verdes, in, in actually Ranch of Palos Verdes. So uh, this home was designed by a very famous current architect named Richard Landry. It's a very big one. All right. Opportunities. So you can be a sales associate with a brokerage, uh, like Gianni. Gianni's a sales associate, but he's with a brokerage, which is Vista, but he's also a member of a team. So you can be by yourself, or you can join a team. You can get into property management, which is a whole other industry where you oversee rental properties for the owners. You can get into lending, which is uh, where you accommodate the loan for a buyer. Uh, you could be an assistant or a staff member. You could be a broker. So I have my broker's license, meaning if I wanted, I can run out and own, own uh, open my own company, Gerard's Real Estate. But I do have a company. Uh, but you could be, you could do that. I mean, I know people have their broker's license. They are not with a company; they're just with themselves. You know, uh, Hugo's Real Estate, and they have a certain clientele, and they just do it. They have, they don't have any really. You know, they don't have. Off, they, they might have an office, but they don't have to give a cut of their commission to the brokerage. They, have, they are their own broker. You can get into commercial or industrial real estate, and you can get into total referral business. You can, you can hang your license with the company and not do any sales, but just know a lot of people that need, you know, and then often they need to sell property. So you refer them to another agent and you get a percentage of the commission. Uh, so there's a lot of different. And there's so many more ancillary industries within the real estate industry besides things. You, know, you could be a title rep. That's I won't get into what all that is, but when I, you know, there's I have so many people uh, within uh, within the real estate industry that are trying to you know get business from me because I am a point person for sales. Title people, even insurance people, call me all the time. It's sort of a related industry, but anyway, there's a lot of related industries. That you can get into. All right. Starting a career. Okay. These days, everything is online. You take an online course, you get the credits. You, have you, you, you got your license? Yes, sir. That's right. Congratulations. Thank Christian, you. this is Gianni. He's on my team. That's That's good good. Christian, yeah. Christian, Christian lives in Palm Springs, right? Or you grew up there, your family's from there. Yes, sir. And I was talking to him at a, at a gathering here. And he said, yeah, I'm in Palm Springs. You know, that's where the Kaufman Desert House is. And I said, dude, I just sold that, yeah. right? So that was really kind of funny. So uh, anyway, you get an online course. There's a bunch of, what, who did you use? Um, Do you remember? I have a, um, you just Google real estate license. It is it, there's a popular, you remember who you used? No, I don't. So there's so many online. There's so many. So what happens is, yeah, you, you find one that works. It's everything is online. You 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 take these courses. You take you know they. You know the drill. You go through uh, all the you know the, like we'll say here's a course on legal items in real estate. So you take a course, take you a few days maybe. You know then you take a, some quizzes in between. Uh, then you go on to another course, real estate principles, right? So you, 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 have, they, you can't do it overnight. They, they require you take a certain period of time. Was it six weeks? Uh, two weeks between each thing. It was $128. Oh, we got it. So, you know, some people want to just power through it, but they, they make you, they, 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 they pay, make you pace yourself. Anyway, over the course of a few months, you get your, you finish, you get a certificate, you've completed the courses. Then you contact the Department of Real Estate. They set up an exam date. You take the exam uh, separate from the online course people. And then you pass the exam. And you're like Johnny and Christian. Uh, you're a licensee, right? Now what do you do, right? 
So now what do you do? You have to choose a brokerage unless you have your broker's license where you can be your own broker, but you have to have two years of experience minimum before they will allow you your broker's license. It's the same exam on steroids. If you're working part-time as a licensee, is it correct that you have to have five years of that before you can be a broker? I thought it was two, but it could be five. Do you know? I think part-time is instead, I don't know really the quality. Yeah, I don't know. About, I know you can also accelerate your broker's license if you have, I think, two year if you're a lawyer. Oh okay, yeah, water. if you're an attorney, it's a whole yes, that's uh, it's a whole different drill. Yeah, yeah. In fact, if you're if you're an attorney, you are I think or you might even automatically are a yeah. broker because within law school you take you take real estate courses that are so much more in-depth than you take just get yeah, right. right. So you choose a brokerage, right? Um so um how do you go about to, to choosing a brokerage? Well, really. The best thing to do, unless you're unless you've moved here from another area, like Sophie is from Los Gatos, did you say? Yes. All right. So let's say you know, and her whole her relatives, her friends, family members, so on, so on. Everybody's in Los Gatos. That is an ideal place to start a real estate. You can have almost a built-in clientele, uh, which, but sometimes. So that's why the best thing to do. When picking a brokerage, if you're going to stay in your area, that is good. That is good. It's not essential. It's not required, but it is a, it is kind of a leg up for starting a career. So you want to, you know, but if Sophie decides she's moving here and she wants to get into real estate, then, you know, this is a little bit out of it, but not completely. And we'll get into that as to why. Um, you want a brokerage that has good training if you're a new licensee. And then you have got the option of joining perhaps a team that can help as well, where there's somebody like me, a team head, that can help direct, mentor, sometimes cost you a little business. Um, so when you're choosing a brokerage, these are all things you think about. Uh, I, again, with, if, if you heard, if everybody heard of Sotheby's, the name yeah. Sotheby's, okay, so Sotheby's, it's an international company. They start out as an art house auctioneer, auction house. Very, very high end art, and then they they spun off years back and started a real estate division. And uh, I like these. Either we are the we are the truly the only real international company. Uh, uh, other companies say they have offices in in other countries. Uh, but nothing like Sotheby's. So I like a brokerage like like uh, what we offer. So it's important. Not essential. Actually, some of the most successful agents I know are with really small companies. Uh, they tend to be the owners of the companies, but they just have built-in clientele and they're you know, they're low, very well known locally. They can get away with that. All right, this is another house uh, designed by the same architect I've mentioned before, Richard Landry. So, questions, sir? This one here, Rancho Palos Verdes. Remember the two homes I showed you on the cover that on the covers they were on the bluffs. This is actually one street behind it. Well, this street's called Laurel. That those streets that was uh, on those other homes were on Marguerite. So starting and building a career, right? Your database is so essential, and the database is going to made up may be made up of relatives, friends, family, friends, alumni, just past acquaintances, and so on. So. When people come to me and say, what's the first thing I do when I start a career uh, or, or new agents, I get classes for um, uh, you know, people who have been in business for six months, a year or two. I said, do you have a database? Have you taken everybody you know? And have you put them down? Said, no. That's the first thing you have to do. And that goes with so many sales. Whatever you do, if you get into sales, you're going to need a database. So it's interesting. People say, oh, gosh, uh, oh, I know so many people. I'll put my dad, I, I probably get two, three hundred. I'll sit down, I probably have two, three hundred names, right? And they just sit down and they start writing names and email addresses and addresses and phone numbers for each one. And uh, I have a program that I put my database into. So that helps uh, a great deal. But you don't think it's like they start writing names down. You get the 25 or 30 people, you start running out of names. Everybody thinks they know so many people, and it's hard, it's, it's more difficult than you think. You're always adding to your database, always adding, you're always refining it, you're getting rid of people. 
you know, they moved out of state or they listed their home, they didn't list with you, they're off, right? Uh, so uh, your database, start your career, your database is essential. So in the course of building a career, I will say you've got, you, you have certain pillars of your occupation. There's certain, my, my business is built on pillars, right? I call them. The database is one of your pillars, right? So here's how I'm going to build my business. I have my database. I'm going to be in touch with them. I'm going to do open houses. That's a pillar. I'm going to advertise, and I'm going to advertise, uh, you know, uh, in a very refined manner and try and be effective. So that'll be a pillar. And, and you get about five pillars because you can't handle it. You can't do a whole lot more than that. Well, you pick a farm of homes and area. Okay, this is going to be, I'm going to become known in this area. I'm going to mail, I'm going to even knock on doors, whatever. That is a pillar. You have to have irons in the fire, but you have to do them well. Uh, anyway, so your first series of clients from starting a career will probably will be people you know, right? Yeah, it's a terrifying thought, yeah. but it, it, it is true. And then after time, you get a reputation. People know who you are. They hear about you. They, and then you build it. You'll get on to other sort of leads. Uh, you got to pick a brokerage, which we talked about. And then some, if you can, brokerages don't really give you leads. We'll get into this a little bit. Real estate has to be very self-starting. It's very self-starting. This is what happens. Christian, welcome to ABC Real Estate. We're so happy to have you with us. There's your cubicle. Good luck. And it's like now what you know it's, it's it, unless you join a team you you really you have to be self and even on a team you have to be self starter but you have to so brokerages are really they're 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 a great support but they're not going to create business for you they help you get business only by with a good reputation like a seller base yes how important is it you know, others backing you as a broker. One more time. How important is it to have a team and a support backing in? Uh, it's, it's, it's starting off, especially, but even different stages of a uh, professional, it, it matters a whole lot because in real estate, every scenario is different, every situation runs different problems. So having the wisdom, the expertise, the support yes. of a team uh, can really help you differentiate yourself from yeah. the, any yeah. other job. Teams are kind of the, the this is the, the last five years. Uh, the so the experts in real estate have indicated that teams are kind of the future. Right? They really are. Up until again five years ago, I've been in business twenty five years. There weren't that many teams, or the teams were sort of like well, eh. now it's 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 uh there's it's like a brokerage within a brokerage, and uh, there's camaraderie, there's support, there's advice. Right. Uh, there's uh, uh, you again know, support. So we have a transaction coordinator. You know that takes care of all your transactions. You need a house and escrow. You hand the paperwork over to her. There's so much paperwork. I pay for her, but you actually pay me some of your commission. And but this is what you get. And then we have, like I said, a marketing person as well. And then you get me. So and, yeah, just to even add up, like one of my first deals was with through. Someone I knew, which is funny, yeah, most of them do come from someone you know or someone yeah. knows of someone. And it's if you, I came into the table, we went into our first listing appointment. If I honestly went alone, you know, everyone that mothers in real estate and no other realtors, I'm fresh off the gate, you know, having someone like Gerard, you know, it's been experienced at a multitude of times. That's what like, the team brings. So I'm going to re I'm going to repeat that for those that are online because they, they didn't, and I, I forgot that I really do need to. So what Gianni said was when he first got into the business, uh, he had people that knew he was in the business and where they kind of wanted to, to work with him, but he needed credibility, right? He needed, he needed, he needed credit and he needed, uh, he, and to, to, for them to him to go into a listing presentation where he's trying to get the seller to, to contract with him to sell the home, he knows he can say, look, we, I am part of a team. We have all this support. The, the, the head of the team, in this case, it's me, has you know all this experience. It sold all these homes. It gives a team member credibility going in. And like Johnny said, yeah. chances are he wouldn't have gotten the listing. Chances are maybe he would have. But going in armed with everything we have to offer as a team gives him an absolute leg up and support. All right. 
Thank you. I have a question following what you're saying. And post in this case for new when you started the uh, company, if you talk about, about credibility uh, when you started. So when you started your company, uh, like when I started you have experience before, or like when I before? started personally, yes, or, or I don't know if you mentioned this before I hear like how, how did you start how did you get into the real estate uh, business? Like, it's a good, it's a good question. No, I did not mention it. And and as I would mentioned a little bit, so the question was when I how did I start? Right now, thirty years ago, it was different than it is now. It was on certain levels, it was easier. On many levels, it was easier. So what I now I will talk about mindset and discipline, right? Just you and and routines. You have to have that. I had mindset going when I first started in the business. I had a routine, and I would I started my business getting in the office at seven a.m. and calling people whose homes had been on the market and did not sell. We call that an expired listing, right? So it expires. They are no longer under contract with the agent that they had had listed for them. So I would call say your home is, has expired. I I, I want to, you know, basically say, I, let me tell you what I can do to get your own soul. And I built my career that's called cold calling. That's specific to expired listings, but cold calling is so much more than that. I would cold call. I built my career on calling people I did not know. That's what I did. So, yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. But yeah, good question. Now, these days, it's harder to cold call. The reason is, you can get numbers from different sources, some you have to pay for, but it's hard to get everybody has a cell phone now, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and a lot of cell phones, like my cell phone rings, it says Telemark, right? Or it says Sotheby, Sotheby's, or say Gerard Bisignano, you know, it might, but, but a lot of times the, your cell phone will notify you and people won't answer. If you're calling from a hard line from your company, it's going to say, Sotheby's or ABC Realty, right? And you say, oh, another one, another realtor call. I mean, no, they're not going to take it. So it's harder now. Um, all right, starting your career. First series of clients, new acquaintances. You got to pick a brokerage. Brokerage is main. The team, if you join a team, some teams pay for leads and then they pass them off. So you, uh, right, Zillow and so on. But that's a whole other thing, but you're not going to get your leads typically from your brokerage. Uh, paid online lead generation system like Zillow, so you can pay these online real estate companies and, and people it, you know, go online, they say, oh, this is a nice house, I really like it, I want more information, and then they click, how do I find out more, and if you pay Zillow, your picture will pop up, and then they call you, and you say, yes, let me show you the home. And uh, it's actually amazingly can be very effective, uh, but it's also not cheap. So starting a business, you can pay for leads. Uh, you can you can actually uh, get referrals from other agents. You can actually it could be a pillar of your business. I'm going to I know a lot of agents around the state that have people that are moving down here. I'm going to hit them up, hit them up, hit them up, and hopefully they'll say yes. I do know somebody moving down your way. I'm going to give them. I'm going to refer them to you. And so you can get referrals from other agents that way, from other markets. Uh, you can get referrals from re agents that are retiring. You can say, I want to buy your book of business, or I'll let me take over your book of business and I'll pay you 50% of everything I get from your book of business for, for a certain period of time. And then if you can refer out of business to people moving to other markets, so you get 25% of the commission. Let's talk about commissions quickly. How much do we get paid, right? Probably the guys don't know how we get paid. Is it like three percent? It, it's it, so it's it kind of depends. So let's say Johnny's going to sell his home. He calls me. Uh, I think he's selling my home. You come over and tell me what you do to sell it. Give me a price and so on. He likes what I say. He writes a contract with me as a listing. Six months typically, and I charge Johnny when we sell the home. Right, it's commission five to six percent. Five to six percent. It's more than five mostly these days. When I first got into the business, it was six more so. And commissions are always negotiable. However, they're sort of a standard five percent commission. So 
Now, if an agent brings a buyer for that house, I split that commission. And that's 80% of transactions involve two agents. Sometimes one agent will get the whole 5%. So let's say on a $2 million home, for instance, 5% is $100,000, right? Another agent. So I will get $50,000 for that sale of that home representing the seller. The agent representing the buyer will get the other 50. Uh, if, I, if the buyer comes to me and I sell it, I would get the whole thing. However, the seller may say, uh, 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 that's a lot of money. I negotiate price. You have to cut your commission so you get less, still a great payday. Yes. Uh, there really how much um, more percent is the referral? Um, yes. Yes. So let's say, yeah, let's say somebody refers me a buyer and uh, uh, I sell them a $2 million home. I get two and a half percent. It's fifty thousand dollars as a commission. I would be a referring agent twenty five percent of that would be twelve and a half thousand dollars. If they have to be an agent, they have to be a licensee. They have to be a licensee. Um, to, get, to get the commission, if, if they're buyer, you to get the commission, they need to be an agent. I'm sorry to get the commission, the referral commission. Yes, yeah, to be an agent. Yeah. Yes. So yes. Yeah. So the question is, yeah. So could let's say Sophie's just a buddy of mine. She goes, hey, right. my best friend wants to sell her house. Give me a referral fee, and she doesn't have her license. Right. Ethically, I'm not supposed to give her any money back. Yeah. Believe me, it happens. <laughs> but ethically, I'm not supposed to. Right. Unless she's a licensee. Okay. She has a real estate license. Thank you for the referral. Twenty five percent. Goes to you of that two percent, and that's negotiable as well. Okay. I mean, that's stain. That's kind of a stamp. Okay. That's usually twenty five percent of your debt. So it's uh, you know a brokerage takes a percentage of them from there. That's the percentage, the twenty five percent of referral that you get yeah. to the other agent. Okay. So here's here's a, a good question. Um, so here are some of the ways you said, how do you build your career? How do you start, right? So I cold called, I cold called expired listings. I would get on the phone, I would cold call entire areas. Typically my pitch would be, I sold the house down the street from you. There's a whole script for this. Sold the house down the street from you. I'll tell you the script, okay? Hi, Sophie, this is Gerard Bisignano from Sotheby's. I just sold the house down the street from you at 123 Maple. We sold it for a million and a half dollars. We had multiple offers and uh, we had a 30 day escrow. People always like to hear. So you kind of intrigue sellers to cold call you, uh, but not sellers yet. You intrigue because everybody wants to know what's going on in their neighborhood. Okay? So Sophie, we know that when uh, someone, when a house sells in a neighborhood, typically two or three people in the area decide it's time to sell. So I was calling to ask, when did you plan on moving? It's a series, the script is a series of questions, you know, and everybody says never, right? But you, then you have another question, really, how long have you been there? Where did you come from? Uh, what made you pick this area? If you were to move, where would you go? And they, they said, well, you know, actually my husband and I were thinking of, I don't think Sophie's married, but my husband and I were thinking of moving to San Francisco because I can't get over there, right? So uh, really, okay, well, when did you want to be in San Francisco? Well, actually, we were thinking maybe after the first of the year. Really? Well, I'd love to help you meet your goal of getting San Francisco by the end, by the first of the year. Why don't we set a time? I'll come over, give you value of the home, and tell you what we do to sell homes. So that's the script for cold calling. You have to have something to say. I sold a home, or even our company sold a home. It doesn't even have to be you. Our company sold a home down the street from you. So that's cold calling. You can door knock basically kind of the same thing, but it's face to face. It's effective, but not efficient. Takes a long time to learn not. Farming, where you pick an area, say, look, I grew up in this area, or I sold a house in this area. I really like it. It's it's active. There's a lot of activity here. It means home sell. You, you identify an area and you become the agent in that area by door knocking, cold calling, mailing. Call that farming. A little self-explanatory when you understand the term farming. You have to have a lot of irons in the fire. That really refers to pillars of your industry, of your business, farming, cold calling. You know, uh, uh, we're calling on listing and sales is what I just demonstrated in the script. So these are things you do, joint community groups. 
Johnny was when he first got in, he started to play. He's a big athlete. He's group joined volleyball groups down in Manhattan Beach. And so yeah. like, you gotta be out there. You, you gotta be out there. And uh, there's no such thing as a secret agent. Let them know your world know your middle school. Right. All right. Guess what? We finished number one. Life of a realtor. Ta-da. Toto, I'm feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. It's a different life. It's, it's really different. You know, everybody know the Wizard of Oz? Or you know that famous expression from the movie? No, you don't. Don't give me this. <laughs> so, Toto, I'm feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. It's like, okay, this isn't exactly what I expected. Real estate's not really, it's it's a different world. It's a fabulous world, but it's not like most other businesses. So, it's my team. You met this handsome young man. My sister, Tiana. Shell, Megan, and Doreen's our transaction coordinator. And then Ariel, who may or may not come, but she's also now part of the team uh, as well. So that's us there. All right. What real estate is not, okay? It is not... Million dollar listing, flip this house, Shaw's Sunset, Love It, Listing, Selling Sunset, all these reality TV shows. That is, is there, has everybody seen a reality TV show? I don't know if you have it. Yeah. Are they all fake? Are they all fake? They were very contrived. I was actually on Open House LA uh, a few times. So I've been, and it's all that when you see that, that is not real estate. Uh, I mean, some of the principles in it, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's all drama. <laughs> And uh, I don't think it's a very good representation of the industry as a whole. I don't think it represents it well. Okay. And there they are. Not this stuff. Interesting sometimes to realize. But, and I know some of these people, or I've met them, I should say. I'll just leave it at that. What real estate is, it's working hard, working smart. I mentioned being self-motivated. It is a people business. It's adapting to change. We're coming to a changing market right now. You gotta, you gotta adapt. Uh, and then well, you gotta be adaptive. It's competitive. Uh, you have to really let frustration and 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 uh uh, uh you know frustration and you know the negative, you know, big people. No, I'm not gonna listen to you now, or you think you're gonna need a listing. You let those things roll off your back. You got to move on, take a deep breath. Yeah, it's okay to be frustrated for a little bit and then you just move on quickly. It's, it's cooperative. You have to be very discreet with your clients, uh, your clients and personal information, uh, especially on the high end. You work with wealthy people. You got to be very careful what you share about their personal lives. You know, you, when you're in residential real estate, man, you are in their personal life and you have to be very discreet about that. You have to be persistent. So, you know, the 80 20, where 20% 20 of the people do 80% of the business, I think we're moving more to a 10 90. But teams are good, frankly. This is one of the reasons, because teams are becoming so prevalent that teams are being very effective out there. So, how do you compete with teams? You get to join a team, right? So, this is what real estate is. Many industries like this, but real estate is definitely because you have to be self motivated. Okay, so when you work, when you're residential real estate, you're working with buyers and you're working with sellers. That's really kind of it. There's some other, you can work with builders. I know people who specialize in finding projects. They put a builder together with the seller. Sellers build one home, 20 homes on these on these lots, and, and that's their whole business. And then they sell the homes for the for the builder. But most of the time it's just you're working with a couple, you're working with a person, you're working with a family, buyer and seller. Okay, so let's uh, work with buyers. How do you get buyers? Okay, so you get buyers by holding an open house. Everybody knows what an open house is, I'm assuming, where the house is for sale, and on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, one to four, whatever, the sellers move out, they're gone, they, and then you said they put a sign, open house sign, you advertise open house. You sit there waiting for people to come, to walk through, looking at the house, try and pick them up as a buyer. Uh, ad calls where you, you know, people will call you, hey, I see this house in your ad. Can you tell me about it? Yes, listen, would like to be love to work with you. Why don't we get to see the house? And then you try and pick people up. 
as a buyer that way. Zillow, as I mentioned, you can buy leads, your acquaintances, family, friends, friends of friends. This is how they, you know, they become your buyers, hopefully. And you have a good reputation out there and then referrals from other agents, from other markets. They're sending you people uh, that are buying a house in your area. All right. What do you do when you have a buyer? You keep them informed. Try, you don't, you know, you don't want to overload them with information, but you want to stay in front of them. Tell them about new inventory that has hit the market that fits their needs. You write offers for them uh, on listings that are typically listed with another agent, but they could be your listing. The escrow process is the process takes about four to six weeks for a house to change title, what we call escrow. And within the escrow period, we do inspections. The buyers do inspections. They inspect the consistence of the house. They'll go back and they'll say, look, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we've got about $20,000 worth of repairs. We need a credit or a reduction in the price. That happens within the escrow period and part of the inspections. Um, you work with the lenders to make sure the buyers can afford the home and that the lending process happens and happens smoothly. Um, you set them up typically with a lender if they don't have their own lender, might be their bank, and then you close that for them. So that's kind of the buying process. Any questions? All right, working with sellers. How do you get sellers? Well, your friends, your clients, past clients, friends, family members that refer, maybe refer you somebody, hey, a good friend of mine, like Johnny gets his most of his business referrals from personal acquaintances. That's how you're beginning your business in particular. So clients, past clients will refer you business. Your farm, I mentioned a, a geographic area where you become the person, the woman, the guy in that area. Uh, and people call you and say, hey, look, I know you are the guy, the person. When I say guy, I mean in a generic sense. Okay. Uh, so I mean in a generic sense. Uh, uh, so you become the person in that area, and people are like, I sell my house with Gianni, it's, he's selling houses everywhere around here, I'm going to call him, that's from farming and becoming an expert in geographic area, open houses, as I mentioned, you can get a seller from an open house, talk about a buyer from an open house, you can get sellers from open house, hey, I live down the street, uh, I'm thinking of selling my house as well, when they come in on the weekends. And be branded as the local expert and do that through all these other processes and then ad calls. You know, if you're advertising, someone can call you and say, Hey, look, I saw you have a house down the street from me. I, you know, I see your ads, uh, they can sell in my house as well. So you can pick up sellers that way. Sellers, okay. When you work with a seller, you get a contract with them to sell their home, fix the price you're going to sell it for, which you with the seller will find the right price for the house. Uh, so you get them a listing contract which has the price and the listing period, a few other things, but mostly that's it. Put it for sale sign up front typically. You will advertise, you will take care of showings when an agent has a buyer that wants to see the home, follow up with these agents or other buyers that have seen the home. They, you help with the negotiation, very involved in negotiations of the buyer purchase of the home. Help through the escrow process on the sales side, as I mentioned, close escrow, and you get paid. So that's kind of the selling process. Any questions? Was that clear? Good. Okay, advertising and branding, building a career. This is a local magazine in our area, called, obviously called Digs. And I, I, I will purchase a cover from time to time. But I advertise on the inside. Here's some branding stuff we do. I did just some stuff. This is the Kaufman House. This is something this, I think we put this in the Hollywood Reporter. This is an ad in the Hollywood Reporter. This one it was, we sold it for 13 million. But that's what I was listed at 19. So this is some promotional branding things. Ah, uh, yeah, glasses. I'm going to show you a video of the house. Video, very big. You know, Hugo said,
and I talk, I, but they were longer, uh, and so I didn't want to put it on, but I enjoy that, and, you know, here's the house, here's the degree, here's the square footage, come with me here, let's, let's take a look at the master bedroom, you know, I'm getting people into it, and those videos are great, and I enjoy it, um, but uh, that one was just a, uh, uh, one we did for social media, because we'd be blasted out. So, when you sell a house, I've talked about escrow, so this is, I'm not going to go through every step here, but this is how complicated the escrow process is or how involved it is. Now, you've got a whole set of duties. You hire an independent company called an escrow company. They get a fee and they accommodate all. They make sure everything happens. So you can see there's a bunch of things. And this is why you pay somebody to do this because the seller side has a whole list of items that need to take place. The buyer side has, has a separate uh, list of things that need to take place. There are some common things, but this is a very involved process. A lot of liability if it's not done right. A lot of things can go wrong. And I've never had things go wrong in an escrow that was caused by what we call the person handling the escrow, what we call the escrow officer, because they're, they just, you know, just, there's just good people out there. But the escrow process is very, very complicated. Uh, and you will become experts in it, though you don't do it, but you have to troubleshoot if things happen. Now, what can be a problem within the escrow? Uh, well, uh, let's see. The seller side, the other title company that sends to the escrow person a what they call a title report. Everybody reviews it, the title company reviews it and says, hey, by the way, the property you're selling has some issues. There's some issues. They can be back taxes. There could be easements, which is right for someone to use the property uh, that may go back a very long time, but it shows up on the title report. So there's a lot of potential pitfalls within the escrow process. I want you to see this so you, just so you understand how complicated it can be. It's why you pay somebody. I mean, you could never do it anyway. I mean, this process here in California in particular is uh, you hire an escrow company and then a title company as well. In some states, or actually in Northern California, it's a little different, but the escrow company and the title company are the same, but the process is exactly the same. So once you see that, any questions? All right, a picture of me taking a picture of us. So um, team, what is it like being on a team? Team offers the opportunity of being uh, mentored by an experienced realtor and piggybacking on their reputation and experience. They can offer sources of leads, backend support, and advertising. So, for instance, Gianni gets a house listed, right? He does not have to pay for advertising. I do. So, I have those, those magazines you saw. I advertise in three magazines, two, pay, two full pages in each magazine. His, his listing will automatically go in there in these ads with his name and his phone number. He doesn't have to pay for everything. I do. So that's part of being, that's one of the, one of the, uh, one of the things about being on a team that can help you. Uh, also social media, our, our social media person is gonna start really working. If Gianni wants to be the one who's on social media stuff, our social, our person will do that. Uh, you do have to give a percentage of your commission to the team uh, that uh, that uh, can be larger than the commission you would give to the, to the brokerage itself if you were a loan agent. Um, 
with us, it's a little different because I'm one of the owners of the company. So we don't have to give a split to the brokerage, right? So it's almost the exact same. Uh, what uh, my team members give to me is not any different than they would give if they were a loan agent in the company for the most part. Uh, team can offer organization structure exposure through the advertising and mentioned leads, mentoring, camaraderie, and support. Maintaining client database, the client loyalty. Most important thing, remember I had mentioned that, most important thing will be if you had to do one thing right, keep your client database and, and, and reach out to them. And uh, once a quarter, I try and touch base with everybody on my database. Um, oh yeah, one of the other questions. Are, re are reality real estate shows a good representation of how the industry works, true or false? I think you know the answer to that one. All right, I'll tell you the third question. There will only be three. Which of the following elements are important parts of building a real estate career? Hard work, being self-motivated, always keeping your client's best interest in mind, or all the above? I would say, yeah, all important. There's more, but those are true. So, so your database, right? So you got to do your database. I told you about that, right? People sit down, they go, I know hundreds of people, they sit down and they start running out about 20 or 30. It's like, gosh, I thought I knew so many people. I don't know as many, or I don't have the contact information as many as I think. But uh, your, 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 alum, your, your buddies here at school, you get out of school, you graduate, you get into residential real estate. They're going to be buyers one day or their parents are going to sell or buy or their brothers or sisters, old, even though you'll be young, you'll be out of here, you'll be 21, 22, doesn't mean you can't start to build a career. When you're in real estate, is this true, Johnny? Yeah, you're about real estate all the time. The downtimes too. All the time. <laughs> One thing on the reality TV shows I will say is true, these realtors are always on the phone, always on the phone, right? It's like being a college student, always on the phone, all the time. But, um, uh, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's it can be self consuming if you don't set up some parameters, some personal parameters, you can get really consumed. Uh, this, okay, a routine, so important in life in general, in life in general, you have to have a daily routine in real estate because it is self motivating, self starting. You have to have a routine. I have a routine every single day. I do the same thing when I get up. And I know, in fact, I can tell. I, I, when I'm done with my initial routine, it's almost an hour to the exact to, to the minute. It's almost as, and I just when I sit down, I start. You know, I'll tell you what it is. You know what my routine is? First hour. Because, well, I'll tell you the whole thing. So I sit down, wake up. I usually get up five thirty, six o'clock. Uh, you know, obviously I I uh, feed the dogs and start the coffee. Right. I put my iPad on. I listen to uh, what they call uh, the daily audio Bible, right? So every day I, it gets you through the Bible in a year if you listen to it every day. So I'm, that's in the background while I'm uh, doing these other things. And then I drink two big glasses of water. This is still going on in the background. And I, then I stretch for 10 minutes. I've got, right? So uh, after that, usually the audio Bible part is done. I sit down, I read a couple of uh, I have some readings that I do every day. Uh, uh, you can tell if I listen to the Bible, obviously my faith is a big deal to me. So I read some what we call daily devotionals, uh, just some great authors that have a daily a daily writing, right? That, that correlates to the date. One of them is by Tony Dungy, who is the uh, first African-American coach to ever win the Super Bowl. He's an amazing man. And so he's got a daily devotional that I do. I, so I read another one. And uh, and then I do some other reading. Then I sit and I kind of I call it meditate. I pray 10, 15 minutes in the morning. It's like, it just clears my head. I think about the people I care about. I want the best for them. You know, I, I really kind of put that out there. And uh, my family and my business and my team members and my company and everything, you know, just get it out there. I kind of have a routine on that too. So, 
then uh, I check my emails and an hour's going by. That's one hour, right? And uh, then I might read some new sites and then I'll typically want to exercise. I make a decision, I'm going to exercise every day. And if you say you're going to exercise every day, then you get it in four days a week for sure. Because there's always some sense something happens, right? So I exercise every day and I exercise about four days a week. And it's like 45 minutes on, on a stationary bike, a little weight work. And then um, so at this time, I maybe return some emails and get ready and get into the office, right? And then if things go well, I get in the office, I'm kind of checking out the day and my date book. I have a list of things I know I got to get done. I try and get 10 calls in a day. I will tell you I'm not the best at it. Try and talk to 10 past clients a day. That way, in between days, I don't get to it and so on and so on. Once a quarter, hopefully, I've gone through my whole database and then I start over again. If I try and reach out to my clients once a quarter, and what do you tell them? Is what do you say to them? You call them and you can leave a message. It works. Say, hey, right? This is Hugo. How you doing, man? I just was thinking about you. Uh, well, you know, wanted to check, you know, I don't want to still say check in, but I just, uh, uh, you know, look at the market is kind of strong or rates are up or this, that. Maybe I'll throw a little real estate out there, but it's very social. Hope you and the family are well. Call me if you have any questions and leaving a message is effective. So all you need to do is register with them as the realtor. And so call your past clients and your database will remind you who to call. You set it up. Here's who you're supposed to call. Yeah. Morning routine. In life, no matter what you do, you should have a morning routine. This isn't what puts you out of the competition. Pardon me? What's, what puts you out of the competition? Other, uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's sort of, I wish I could answer that with a specific answer. It's sort of an intangible. You work hard, you get a reputation, people trust you, the word gets out. You know, I know people like, you know, I do, I do a good business. I know people have been in the business as long as me, they don't do, they don't do any business. You know, what's the difference? You know, and then there's people in the business long, as long as me that do more business than me. You know, there are not many, but some. And you know what is what's there's intangibles that you can't really put a finger on, but there are there, there is a common thread. It's a great question because there is a common thread between all successful realtors, but that's in any industry. So this is just a great life, really just a life concept. There is a common thread between successful people in your industry. They all may be different. The successful realtors I know, they're all different than me. I mean, I don't even some I don't like some. It's just the way it is. They don't like me, you know, but they're successful. They're different than me. And they, but everybody can does there's no there's no cookie cutter personality for success. But there are common threats for successful people. And it's hard work, it's a mindset of success, objections, you're gonna get them, you're gonna get frustrations. Don't dwell on. It's okay. You're always going to be sad or frustrated or angry because something happened, but just don't be, get it behind you. And uh, it's a mindset. It is a it is a mindset of success. And you know, most successful people I know have a morning routine, right? So it's I I can't identify it because if I could, everybody would do it, right? I mean, it's but it's it's just a it's just and everybody's formula is different. Some people have relatives that have been in the real estate business for a long time. So they automatically walk into the industry with a name, right? So you can't, you can't compete with that, you don't. So, but the common threads are mindset, uh, uh, hard work, self-motivated, work smart, to work smart. In this business, it's too easy to do nothing and think you're busy all day long. It's too easy. Before COVID, everybody came into the office, most people go into the office, into the brokerage. You know, you wake up, you know, you pet the dog, just whatever, you feed them, you go to the, you have some coffee, you talk to your partner, your spouse, whatever, leave. Uh, you go to the office, you roll in 9, 9.30, uh, you go have another cup of coffee, you talk to some agents, maybe you check your computer, what's the new listings, what homes have come on the market in my area. You know, you walk around, you talk a little, suddenly it's lunchtime, 
you go to lunch with another agent or two, you get back to the office, it's 1 30. Gee, my car's dirty, maybe I should go get it washed. And then you do a little shopping, you know, and then you come back to the office, talk to a few agents, have another cup of coffee. Hey, it's 4 30, maybe it's time you go home. And then your roommate, your wife, your spouse, your partner says, How was your day? Oh, so busy. You didn't get anything done, but your day was filled, right? That is real estate. And it's too easy to fall into that trap. And that's life in general. It's too easy to fall into that trap. So routine, focus. It's okay to waste a little time. It happens. But you then you pick yourself up and get back on the track and you get things done. And that is the difference between successful realtors and realtors that are just realtors. And again, that applies. Okay. Morning routine. Plan your Plan, plan your day from the time you wake up to 12 noon, the rest of the day will fall together. A very famous real estate coach came up with that saying. Just plan your day from the time you wake up to 12 noon, the rest of the day. Hi, Ariel. That's Ariel. She's the head of our marketing. We got a lot of people on Zoom too. They can't see you, Ariel. But anyway, thanks for coming. Uh, talking about morning routines. So plan your day from the time you wake up to 12 noon, the rest of the day will fall together. Right? Exercise, gather your thoughts. I talked about my morning routine. The hot sheet, that's that's something you pull up on our multiple listings. So it's here's the new listings in your area called the hot sheet. Organize your day. Hopefully you have appointments that you get ready for and pass clients, call past clients, spend a day, leave a message. We talked about that. Leave a message. So uh and that works. And then every quarter you go back you cycle. So that's part of the morning routine that I do and I think is for success, success of people. Any questions? You can ask too, or <laughs> any questions on them? You kind of covered that. There we go. All right, cold calling and expired sales we talked about. Uh, networking and personal accountability. So networking is where you talk with other agents or what we call networking groups where agents just have an informal group they meet once a week whatever, and they talk about what's coming on in the market to sort of get the inside scoop on stuff that's coming for your clients. Uh, you must be accountable to yourself and to others. And then coffee with past clients or prospective clients. It's, very, it's a very smart idea uh, just to kind of keep things going. So final thoughts on, on, on being a realtor, right? Be constructive. Are your actions income earning? Remember the day I told you the day goes by, you didn't, you think you're busy, you did nothing? Were there any actions or income earning within that? Uh, it's easy to fill time with non income producing activities, but within we gave you the day of, of uh, so many agents. So, um, okay, good. Managing, okay. Real estate, real estate and wealth creation. Let's just talk about that a little bit. Um, I think 80% of the wealth in this country has been has been created through real estate on some level, real estate. So uh, what would be a typical sort of path for creating wealth for real estate? So uh, you, buy, you buy your first house, you buy some little fixer somewhere, right? And you somehow cobble together a, a down payment, you buy the house. And you sit on it and you work on it and you improve it, right? And a year or two or three or whatever goes by, right? Now it's worth 25% more than you bought it for, right? So let's just pull some real numbers. Let's say you bought it for $500,000 and uh, now it's worth uh, six fifty dollars or 700000 you, you, by, by just living, you've earned $200,000 in, in, in uh in uh in equity in 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 uh on your balance sheet right on your wet on your net worth and then so now you know you have to put 20 percent down on a on a house so you bought it for five and but your loan was for four so your spread if it's worth 650 is really 250 right because you put 100 in you owe 400 000, you get a loan a 30-year mortgage but it's worth 650 it's a 250 you're worth 250 thousand dollars more right so what can you do? You could sell it and take that 250 and go buy something, another opportunity, or better, you go to a lender, gives you 80% of the value, but say, look, uh, the house is not worth, let's put it easy now, let's say it's 700,000. 
house is worth seven hundred thousand, you only owe four. They're gonna, they're gonna, you can up your mortgage and get cash out. You can take that cash, keep this house, go buy another house. That's because the the value of the house has gone up. You can borrow against it. That is typical wealth creation in real estate. You know, you rent it out. Hopefully, it covers your mortgage. You go buy something else. Same thing happens. It goes up in value. Same thing happens over time. You pull money out, go buy something else. If, if there's a great adage, never sell real estate, buy, never sell. Uh, it's if you can do it, it's not always easy, but if you can do it, that is the way to do it. So, uh, any questions? Final thoughts coaching. So, you can actually pay a coach, there's coaching, we can pay a coach. A uh, real estate coach to uh, to help guide your career. It's not inexpensive, but it can be very very effective. I actually did, uh, did coaching for like 15 years. I had I paid uh, two two different companies in particular. I worked with both of them, and I had a coach coaching, coaching call every every week. Keeps me accountable, right? What are you doing? What's working? What's not working? Why are you doing that? Why don't you do more of this? Oh yeah, that makes sense. Because sometimes you need people to tell you, right? Uh, we talked about your cold calling, expired listing that came out the market, calling around the new listings and sales. We talked about that as well. Script, we talked about a script. So uh, we talked about reality, reality shows. It's fun to watch, but that is not how real estate is. If you end a real estate career thinking these, this is how it works, you're gonna, you're gonna. Uh, you're going to uh, have some, uh, you're going to think it's going to take you time to realize that's not how it works. You got to go in thinking, okay, real estate is really self discipline working hard, working smart, uh, your contacts, nurturing your database. Uh, you know, some of that is real, but some of it, most of it is not. So, and there's so much information on YouTube. If you want to know about real estate, there's so much good information. There's a lot of junk but there's a lot of good stuff too i go to youtube for everything <laughs> you know i want to learn about just about anything i start there but then you have to sit through what's what's really true and what's good all right questions questions all right good let's take a break let's take a break okay what do you see what do you think of when you see this of Los Angeles, right? So designed by Paul Revere Williams in collaboration with some other architects. First, first black architect to ever be admitted to the AIA, American Institute of Architecture, Paul Revere Williams. The, 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 the restaurant at LAX. You can see what do you think of the LA, right? Griffith Park Observatory, John C. Austin in collaboration with you see a picture of this, you think of Los Angeles. Union Station, I don't know if you've ever been there, it's amazing. See these photos, Richard Meyer, very famous architect, still alive. The Getty Center. He also did a Disney Theater. Richard Meyer, um, City Hall, King of LA, John C. Austin, same guy that did, um, I forgot the book part. Hollywood Bowl, King of LA, Lloyd Wright, not Frank Lloyd Wright, who I mentioned, his son, Lloyd Wright, all the time. Frank Geary actually did this. He also did the LMU Law Building. So you just did a uh, apartment complex with the related group here in downtown. Who? Gary? Yeah, so. Yeah, probably. So what's the point, right? Oh, right? So the point is, when you see these images, what do you think? You think of Los Angeles. Architecture has such impact, right, on, on a city, on a community. It's like the whole personality of community sometimes can be of a large city can be summed up in a photo of a building. And the point is that architecture has such impact on our lives, on our culture, on our uh, 
of a, of a certain area, right? So what we're going to talk about in the next 30 minutes or so is going to be, uh, we're going to study the uh, influence of Southern California past and present masters, architectural masters, and explore their influence on Southern California art, architecture, culture, and lifestyle. We will journey, which love it, we're going to journey, I'm just going to talk, really, but we're going to journey with the past influence such as Frank Lloyd Wright, who I've mentioned, Richard Neutra, who did the Kaufman House, Pia Koenig, who did the Stahl House, I will talk about, very, very, very famous, Paul Revere Williams, who I spoke about, uh, Ray Cappy, I talked about him earlier. Uh, he, he was the founder of an uh, architectural school uh, in Los Angeles called SciArt. And uh, the, the current influencers like Richard Meyer, who we saw a picture, we did Richard Landry, Tom May, Frank Geary. We're not going to talk about all of these, but these are some of the big names in architecture. Uh, we're, all, we're also going to explore the images of Julius Schulman. If you are into architecture at all, this is an enormous name, enormous. He, he is such, this, he took this image of the coffee house. And he took another image, very famous, called the Stall House. I'm gonna show it to you. And uh, we're gonna talk about him and, uh, and his ability to capture the most iconic architectural images that actually made architects famous. Julius Shulman images were resonating so much that it made these, these architects, even I think Frank Lloyd Wright or Richard Neutron, one of them admitted that it was Julius Schumann, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, Julius Schulman made his career. Uh, of course, Frank Lloyd was already famous, but his whole story is career died. There was a regular, excuse me. Uh, we'll talk about the Kaufman House as well and the influences it had on the modernist movements of California. All right, this is, this is an example of mid-century modern. Probably say, oh, so my parents were kids. That's the style they grew up with. Well, it was, right? So uh, mid-century modern kind of post-war, it's 1940, but really sort of 1945 to 1970, uh, mid-century modern was like the style in Southern California, not just Southern California, but mostly, mostly Southern California. Ground zero, it would be Palm Springs. This is probably the most famous mid-century modern home in the country. I mean, I don't even think it's an argument, but that's it. So we're talk a little bit about the style and uh, how the influence on Southern California. This is postmodernism. It was sort of the next style that rolled in. I don't like it. What is it? What building? This is post. This well, this is in Venice. This is in Venice. It's a an advertising agency called. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's kind of looks like the style of the business building here. Yeah. Yeah. So you see, postmodernism has squared angles and rounded angles, squared, rounded, right? Squared off, rounded. It's, it's, you know, it tried. I mean, mid century modern, they were tearing down mid century modern homes up until seriously, really, the Kaufman House resurrected the whole mid century modern movement. And, uh, and it resurrected it. Otherwise, they were tearing these homes down. People thought they were boring. And, you know, this is my parents' house. It's what they grew up in and so on. And then now it's come back. Well, will postmodernism come back? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a fan. Okay. All right, guys. After World War II, there was unprecedented demand for housing, right? So America's economy was strong. GIs were coming home. They were starting families. They needed a housing that was functional, easy to build and fit. Uh, with the new modernism style of the time. So that's why this mid-century, look, there we go. So mid-century modern, uh, you know, it, it angles, uh, easy to live in, a uh, lot of windows and light, instead of the California, it was like it became the style because it was so functional and it was not expensive to build. So these are some of the you know, things that were going on back then. And of course, the whole style of the home really was a reflection of Elvis or Cadillacs. Rock and roll. Okay. What well, was like the, the biggest uh, time for uh, real estate sales in, in California? Like, when did it become so popular? Forever. Forever. Yeah, forever. Because now it's. Yeah, the big, well, but it's always in cycles. 
Yes, we're going, we're in downside. Do you think it's going to fall? It has more with the economy, not with the, it has more had to do with the economy, not right. that California yeah. is, is not a place, that, it's not a destination. That's not the reason why. It's not because California is fading as a destination, though to some degree, you know, we are getting a, 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 more people are leaving than coming. Yeah. But mostly in Northern California, San Francisco area, that whole area is like there's an exodus. It's not to over dramatize it, but there are more people leaving than coming in you know, north from the north. So Frank Lloyd Wright, I've mentioned it, he's probably he's the most famous American architect that ever existed. Okay, father of modern architecture. But he really wasn't a mid-century modern architect per se, later in life, yes, more so. Uh, but he actually, Frank Lloyd Wright, it's a big name, and the rest of you are going to hear this name over the course of your life when it comes to architecture. He is the biggest name. Richard Neutra would be probably second. Um, and he had, a, so he had a great influence on architecture. He died in 1969 at a ripe old age. Uh, he was in his 90s. Uh, he had an amazing career in the early part of the 19th century. His, his career literally died and then it resurrected. Totally it resurrected completely and he became famous again. He had like two careers. And interestingly, it resurrected because a house that he built for a gentleman in the late 30s became very famous. Fast forward 10 years later, the same gentleman named Kaufman and Richard Neutra, Neutra built this home for him. So this gentleman, Kaufman, Edgar Kaufman Sr., had two of America's most famous architects, built him two homes, one in Pennsylvania, falling water, you can see a picture of it, Frank Lloyd Wright design. Richard Neutra, they became the most famous homes in the country. One man commissioned two of America's architects, two American architects, and these two homes that he commissioned became the most famous homes in the country. This guy, Edgar Kaufman, he owed architecture owes a great deal to him. So, uh, frankly, right trained Richard Neutra, Rudolf Schindler, John Lautner, you don't know these names, but they're very famous architects, mid century modern. John Lautner was a little after mid century. Schindler was a mid century modern architect. They all trained uh, under Wright, worked in Los Angeles. So, but Frank Lloyd Wright, big, 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 this is falling water. So Edgar Kaufman in the late thirties owned this land in Pennsylvania with a waterfall. He was a department store magnate. Frank Lloyd Wright's career had died. He was, he needed, he needed money. He started an architecture school because he had at least a name still. Edgar Kaufman's son was going to the architecture school when he decided to build the house. He said, let's have Frank Lloyd Wright do it. And Frank Lloyd Wright built this home, probably the most famous home in the country, Falling Water in Pennsylvania. It's not, it's in public hands. It's owned actually by the state or by the county or something. So it's not, and that is called Falling Water. Very famous. Frank Lloyd Wright, who trained Richard Nitra. This is another house Frank Lloyd Wright did in Los Angeles. The first house he did here in LA called the Hollyhock House. I've mentioned it earlier. We did a broadcast from there. Ooh, wrong button. This is another Frank Lloyd Wright house called the Ennis House. Okay, Richard Neutra. This is called the Coon House. Okay, my client that owns the Kaufman House owns this house as well. Okay, this was the first architectural picture Julius Shulman took, right? It, it made his whole career. That's the Coon House right there. Uh, built in 1937 or eight. Uh, this guy Kuhn owned a uh, newspaper in Los Angeles. He built this house, Neutra built it. It was really before mid-century modern. It has mid-century uh, influences, but mid-century really didn't come together or coalesce style for another decade or so. Uh, but Kuhn bought this, and then people started building houses and blocking his view, so then he bought the thought, built another house up here. Well, Coon too. So, but my client owns Kaufman owns that house, and I actually manage it for him. Right now, it's it's a construction site. It's refitting it uh, for earthquake, but there isn't much going on there. But he doesn't rent it out or anything. Um, so I I visit him, I collect mail, I go take photos for him, send him the progress, and so on. 
This is a Rudolf Schindler house. Great story about him, Neutra, but they were friends. Uh, and they actually, uh, they lived together in the same house with their wives. This might have been in the house. Rudolf Schindler, big influence on Los Angeles. John Lautner, who I mentioned also, apprentice in the Frank Lloyd Wright. This is a house he did in Los Angeles called the Pod House. Is anybody familiar with this? It's still there. It's interesting because the idea on this hillside, I'm looking over Hollywood, saw it. The idea was to build a series of the houses along the hillside. It never got half owned. This is the only one that imagine what that would look like, the influence that that would have on them. It'd be like the Hollywood sign, right? But the, he just built the one. So I'm by a guy that owns a uh, publishing company that publishes a lot of architectural homes. All right. So as I mentioned, these are some of the apprentices of. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, Richard Neutra, John Lautner, who did the Pot House, Rudolph Schindler. Big influences on mid century modern in Southern California. Okay, now this is somebody, sort of one of the unsung heroes of mid century modern in Los Angeles, a gal named Aileen Barnstall, right? She was an heiress for the oil company. She brought, Frank Lloyd Wright was an architect in Chicago. Aileen Barnstall brought Frank Lloyd Wright out from to LA, did the first Frank Lloyd Wright house called the Hollyhock House, I'd show you a photo of, um, in 1923. And it really was the genesis of mid-century modern movement here because he was here, his apprentices were here, with the style developed, it became a major force. She was also a huge force in the Hollywood, in the Hollywood Bowl. So this woman really started mid-century modern movement by bringing Frank Lloyd Wright here, she had the money, she had the creativity, she was also the Hollywood Bowl. Interesting a little tidbit about Frank, about an alien Barnstall, quite scandalous. She had a she had a baby without a husband. She was a lesbian. So can you imagine in 1923 how scandalous that would be? Today it's like whatever, but back then. So she was a brave, bold woman, brave woman, Aileen Barnstall. Uh, and then, so now, photography's influence. Uh, I talked about Julius Schulman, and that's who we're going to talk about here. So, Julius Schulman photographed for 70 plus years, captured some of the world's most amazing structures and space that ever created. He set the standard that others now strive to reach. And um, when they can't, they simply stage a shout that looks like a Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright house. Um, Schumann brought mid-century modern to the world as much as legendary architects that he worked with, ones I've mentioned, and so many others. Uh, he, was not, he was sought out not for, only for his, his, his amazing eye, but his ability to understand and interpret the architect's intent. So architects have intent. They just don't draw lines, make rooms. They have a vision that is very uh, almost ethereal. And they get it, and most people just say nice house, but they have such an intent, and he's able to capture their intent. Uh, he is the standard, Julius Schulman. And you can't talk about the influence of architecture in Southern California without Julius Schulman. So this is him. This is the stall, stall house. Uh, I'll show you the famous photo of it. But this is him taking a picture of the stall house, probably his most famous image. Again, probably his second most famous image. But without a doubt. Oh, this is the, actually the famous image on my head, Will, because you can't see the whole thing as this is here. Uh, this is a documentary. I'd highly recommend it if, if you're all interested. It's called Visual Acoustics. It's about Julius Schulman. It is unbelievable. Uh, master photographer. He helped truly shape the careers of many architects by making these images that just resonated with the public, and then they wanted the architect to build their homes. Visual acoustics on Netflix. It's fantastic. Um, if you're interested, highly recommend just take a look at it on Netflix. Uh, Pierre Cotty designed this home. These are some other names you may not know, but you've definitely seen their images, their homes. The Eames, you know, the area familiar with the Eames, famous Eames chair. Designed a chair to this day is famous. You can still buy it because one company has the patent to design it. And, and uh, uh, anyway, the Eames was up where they were a couple. They were in the well. 
There's the image right there. That's Schumann's most famous image called the Stall House in Los Angeles. It's also a case study in the 22 case study homes. It's another story. We'd love to tell you, but I think there's a lot of content. I don't want to clog your minds. Julia Schulman, 1947, Kaufman House. This is Mrs. Kaufman. He said, Will you lay there and you could block the reflection of the light in the pool? As she did, and it became such a huge part of the photo. Uh, it's an enormous, I, so this is the house I would give tours of. I told you the people I showed it to. The pool is enormous, especially for the time in particular. We went and build big pools like this for this. It's huge. And a fun story, a couple of quick stories. Julia Schulman finished, I'm sorry, Richard Neutra finished the pool first. So we could stand in it in the hot summer and direct construction. But he made sure the pool was done first. Uh, there's a lot of stone in the house. This, this whole wall here, the entrance is here. You walk along this corridor to the front door. This is all stone. There's a big wall here. This part of here extends back, all stone. Big fireplace up top here, what they call the Gloriette, all stone. The living room and fireplace, all stone. I mention it because when my client bought the house in 1993, and he renovated the house and brought it back to its original condition when it was new. The stone that got the, the mine that got the stone from in Utah had been closed. My client had the mine with money reopened just to get stone to replace it on, on that was missing. That's just an example of the meticulous processes the, 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 the past owner went through. To, uh, to renovate the house. And when he pulled Julius Shulman out of retirement to photograph it again in 1998, Julius Shulman said it was just like it did 50 years ago when he took this image. And that was the intent. And that's the way it was done. It's a time warp. This is Eames House. This is another Julius Shulman image. It's in Los Angeles. This is the famous image. Okay, of the Kaufman House called Poolside Gossip by Slim Aaron Stig in 1970. She was the owner at the time. It was Nelda Linsk. And if you haven't seen this image, it is everywhere. And not only is it everywhere here, it's actually more popular in Europe than it is here. And the set in the by the new current owner is European. So that's the famous image. It's not as bright as it could be to really make it pop, but uh that's the famous image. Has anybody, have you, have you seen this image before, Sophie? Have anybody? I know you've seen it. Yeah, of course you've seen it. So that's a cool side gossip. That's the image on the back of the catalog. It's from the same. All right. Well, there are comic, yeah, I mean, what do you know? Again, architecture, what do you think? Oh my gosh, Italy, Pisa. Uh, so, you know, again, so, some recommendations, documentary, there's a lot of documentaries. Uh, visual acoustics is awesome. It's, it's narrated by Dustin Hoffman. And then there's another, oh, this is another great series. I think it's on Netflix. Frank Lloyd Wright, two-part series by Ken Burns. He's the most famous documentarian there is. He did the Civil War, baseball, jazz, very, very famous Ken Burns. So he did this two-part documentary, Frank Lloyd Wright, if you're interested. Highly recommend it. It's amazing. It's an amazing story. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for coming, guys. All right. Any questions? Who's your favorite architect? Ah, uh, well, I'm biased. I'm probably Richard Michael. Yeah. You know. Yes. What has been your favorite experience over all of your years of real estate? Selling the career. Without a doubt. Yeah. The highlight of my career. It, which is exactly how I express it to my client or close that's right. The highlight of my career. Uh, how many people <laughs> to do that? Just what? One. <laughs> yeah.